Welcome to the Phase Space Invaders podcast, where we explore the future of computational biology and biophysics by interviewing researchers working on exciting transformative ideas. Today, my guest is Vlad Kozokaru, a researcher working on the computational biology of transcription factors, affiliated with Max Planck at Münster, with Utrecht University, and with Babesh Boyai University in Cluj Napoca. To make a connection with a previous episode, Vlad is also a regional BioExcel ambassador for Romania. For a good while, we have both been working on similar research questions, with Vlad's recent work exploring the question of DNA mediated allostery or pioneer transcription factors that are key for cellular reprogramming. So we start the conversation from the purely scientific side, talking about how the field might go about integrating further layers of complexity in modeling transcription control and genome organization in humans. It's just in recent years that experiments start to provide high resolution data about this incredibly complex and hierarchical interplay. And a lot of work will be needed to turn it into molecular level insights that will one day translate into therapeutic modalities. We then move on to discuss, I think, a severely underexplored question of scientific returns to our home countries. As two researchers who sooner or later plan to take this step, we are dissecting the hopes and fears that come with it, trying to outline some conditions for success and rewrite the common narratives, at least from our very particular points of view. Okay, enough of this introduction. Let's go. Great. Vlad Kojokaru, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot, Milos. That's a, it's a great uh, initiative. Congratulations for it. Thanks a lot. So Vlad, I know we followed each other's work for a good decade now, overlapping in the field of protein DNA interaction and recognition. And when I reflect upon it, in thinking about your more recent paper, I'm kind of impressed by the increasing scale and uh, degree of biological context in the ways we are beginning to address scientific problems. Where do you think we are on this journey? And, you know, going back to your papers again, what might be the next challenges in transcription control you think we'll be able to tackle? I'm thinking, you know, epigenetics, the transcription machinery, full-sized proteins, chromatin structure, RNA, and so forth. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I think we are um, approaching the moment where we actually can tackle uh, much larger systems using this kind of very detailed atomic uh, simulations, right? Because that's what we are doing. We are doing computer simulations and trying to understand the biology of it. And then this comes back to, to the times when I was in Münster and basically I got fascinated in this uh, stem cell, right? Where you have cells that you can convert from one type to the other, right? You can, you can go from skin to, to pluripotent cells, right? You can make like an embryo from, from a skin cell, right? Or if you think that's crazy. So I got really fascinated into that, and there are these molecules which are called transcription factors that actually are master regulators of this process. So you can just put two of your folds into a skin cell, for instance, and you can completely change the fate of that cell. And that was, for me, absolutely fascinated at that time. Um, but I wanted to understand how these transcription factors work, right? So, so basically what we did, we, uh, I came from the computer simulation point of view, and I said, well, you know, we can start... Uh, using the developments that we recently have in, in uh, simulating macromolecules and try to tackle this question. How do these transcription factors are able to change the entire uh, landscape of a cell, right? So we started um, small things, transcription factors on DNA. That, that works relatively well, the current method. But then we got the idea, okay, what if we go one scale up? And now you know, maybe you know that, uh, well, for sure you know, <laughs> Uh, in, in, the, in the cell, the DNA is packed, right? So you have uh, this massive two meters of DNA is packed in a very, very tiny nucleus. And then you have uh, this nucleus, which are, which are kind of, uh, they are kind of structures which, which pack like 100, about 147 of, of base pairs of DNA around some histone proteins. So now when these transcription factors, if you remember, when, when they bind to the DNA, they have to recognize the structures. So now we started going into that direction and basically... At the moment, we are simulating the binding of these transcription factors to these structures, which are nucleosomes, which uh, now you get in the range of millions of atoms, basically, in a single run. 
which is great. And um, we have a number of difficulties here. So uh, the way these transcription factors bind to nucleosomes, they are not exactly well defined, especially not on native nucleosomes. So that's a major challenge. That's why we have to go to the experiment uh, and we have to validate every single binding event, every single binding locations and so on. So um, it's not an easy thing to do, but the, the question that we start to be, to, to be able to answer is how the structure of the nucleosome, the structure of the DNA wrapped around the histones is changed when the transcription factors bind. So now this is the level where we came to, but now the question is, these transcription factors don't change one nucleosome. They change an entire genome. So how does that happen? So now my dream would be that in the next, in the future, we'll be able to use even fully atomistic simulations where each atom is, is represented to actually tackle the question how, how these transcription factors change the arrangements of multiple nucleosomes and stuff like this. Uh, but we, I think we are still far from that point. At the moment, we mostly basically try to understand how each nucleosome is changed by the transcription factor. And of course, then you have the epigenetic landscape, right? Each nucleosome is modified in certain positions to actually uh, give this layer of epigenetic regulation. And that we can all include into the simulations. And that's the beauty of it. Because in the simulations, you can actually have things that are very hard to tackle experimentally. So these proteins that wrap the DNA, they have these very floppy ends, which are called the tails. And they are very, very tricky because they are very, very flexible. They move back and forth. And those in experiments, if you look at all the structures of nucleosomes, only one single one of them has these tails. And in simulations, we can actually use them. We can have them in every single simulation we do. Um, well, the accuracy is an issue, of course, but we are at the moment quite active in, in describing these interactions. So I think we are at a level where we can start tackling uh, basically larger arrangements of nucleosomes and also proteins like these transcription factors that interact with it. Right, that's amazing. I think many people take this picture, especially in, in the case of transcription factors, take this picture from bacteria, right? Where all those things, all those complexities don't even exist. And there's just some sort of sigma factor binding to a promoter and then everything goes smoothly. And we've got this hugely complicated embryogenesis that relies on so many things, right? We have, for example, the chromatin remodelers, right? That are machines that are walking on chromatin and remodeling, reorganizing nucleosomes with ATP derived energy. And uh, then we have polymerases that also have their own pushes, pulls. So is there any hope for us even to, I, I'm just thinking about this, you know, multi-scale approaches as well, right? At which level we'll have to model the biology with some sort of multi-scale methods, including coarse grain or even like mesoscale uh, we, methods. We will, always, we will always need multi-scaling because at, at this point, it's, it's, it's very key to simulate all these motions that are involved. So you can imagine if you talked about the, the remodeling, right? I mean, this involves practically evicting the histones. You have this nucleosome, it's, it's a round kind of shape, helix, if you wish, with the DNA rule. You have to actually remove the histones from it. Uh, then you have to slide the DNA. And, and these are motions that are very, very hard to tackle from with the atomistic simulation. For, for this type of motions, you do need cross grain simulations. So I think we already have quite a number of... Um, in fact, I would say that in the field of genome organization, cross grain methods are still more used and they up hand on the atomistic ones, just you can, you can tackle much bigger problems, right? Uh, and much mm -hmm. larger types of motions. Having said that, you, of course, you lose the details of the atoms interacting, which are very important. Um, but with cross grain, you can tackle this type of uh, large scale motions and large scale systems, right? So, so uh, we will always need it. This is a genome organization coming from the a base pair of the DNA until the whole chromosome. This is a typical multi-scale and you will always need different types of models to actually tackle different questions up to the polymer physics, right? Which, which are used to, to tackle the, the organization of the crop. It's fascinating. So the way that the genome is organized is absolutely fascinating. And as you go up in scale, of course, you will, at some point, you will not be able to do it atomistically, to, to have all the atoms there. So. Yeah, absolutely. But on the other hand, as you mentioned, we have the histone code, right? The histone, the very tiny modifications. Sometimes it's a single methylation that absolutely changes the whole landscape of macroscopic behavior. 
this is also kind of working on the phase separation level, right? So the physics of phase separation is also getting into um, the field. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's, also, that's recently. also kind of novel concept, right? Looking at this phase separation, uh, how especially um, interesting for the, I mentioned to you, this terminal unstructured, right? Uh, floppy tails of the, of the histone proteins that wrap the DNA. And there is, there is emerging evidence that basically this kind of help creating this kind of phase separation, basically creating regions in the phase space where transcription actually is, is active. Now this, this is one of the fascinating uh, part of the newest developments. And the other part is, of course, um, genome organization and transcriptional control. It's a field where AI is still at the beginning, right? It's not so much data, but, but I'm sure that in, a few, in the next years, it will start picking up. If I went recently to a conference about the multi-scale genome organization, and, and then you really see, um, if you compare it to the protein structure field, where we're AI everywhere, here we don't have much AI. And that's the reason for that is that all the uh, machine learning, deep learning the algorithms, they need a lot of data and the, the data is still scarce. So uh, so I'm looking forward also for this development because I'm, I'm really certain in, in a few years from now, we will see a lot of AI prediction tools uh, aiming to predict the structural dynamics of, of, of uh, nucleosomes, arrangement of nucleosomes and so on and so forth. So uh, very, very exciting times from that point of view. Absolutely. And then we also have the experimental techniques such as this cryo e tomography, right? I recently saw a paper, I don't know if you saw it too, where they were able to show the 3D organization of, of chromatin, assigning, you know, nucleosomes, uh, chromatosomes, the distinguishing between the H1 bearing and the H1 free nucleosomes in the actual cell nucleus. So pretty amazing that we're going to have this data soon to, to train our model, to reproduce that. That's absolutely fantastic. That's amazing data, basically, where you, where you really can look at a few number of nucleosomes basically are associated together. And then you can also look at full fibers where it's like, uh, uh, genome organization has been right in the middle of a debate, this kind of uh, 30 nanometers fibers, very, um, and now we know that that's not really the case, that even the closed chromatin is very dynamic and. And being able to visualize it with, with, with this kind of uh, cryo-ET technique, cryo uh, electron tomography, uh, really gives the, the, the data that we can then use in the simulation. We can use uh, we can use this data to build models, to, to refine dynamic models, and so on. Um, so I think this is also an, uh, fascinating now. I, I mean, on my career, I, I loved working with experimenters, right? So this has kind of... Uh, it's a stamp on my career and say, even from the beginning of my PhD to today, we're basically, uh, working close, close by, uh, with experimenters, even if they are like developmental battle. Um, and this has been always, always very nice. And I hope I can continue doing that. Basically. Yeah. I think we should all stick to that. I mean, it's a very common theme in this collaboration between physics and biology that, for example, physicists will come up with something like the zigzag model or the solenoid model where everything is nicely arranged, right? It's symmetric. And so when they look, you look at the actual biological structure and it's like a complete mess that maybe 30% of one and 20% of, of the other and everything in the middle is, is just completely undescribable by simple, like human readable pattern. So we need to keep both mentalities of like order and chaos in check in this way. Probably may, will be able at some point to actually find new patterns that can describe this, uh, this chaos as you name it, right? Yeah, there's statistics for everything, of course. Sure, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, then to the other topic. So you are now m moving back to your home country of Romania. And we were discussing this question of returns in academic careers, right? So how do you see the pros and cons, the ups and downs, you know, of going to, to have a career in, let's say, Western labs and then bringing the expertise back? I mean. I'm planning to do the same. So I'm asking you as a fellow person on this journey, how do you, yeah, how do you see this unfold? Really this, this is, um, the one most major decision in my life until now, probably, um, taking this opportunity to go to, to the Robert Boya University in Cluj Napoca. It's, it's with mixed feelings, but with a lot of hope. So I think 
if we are about to talk the positive uh, stuff first, I think um, the developments in Romania, but not only in Romania, I'm talking more of the entire Eastern Bloc, if you if you wish, um, are really interesting. And I think there is a lot of potential there. So um, we all know the, the brain drain that happens in, in these countries, right? So, so people go abroad, uh, which, is not, which is not bad. Uh, it's actually good. Yeah, I, I gain amazing uh, experience by going abroad. But the, the thing what happens is that I don't, don't return. Um, so that's at least with Romania, that has been the case and, and still the case. Quite dramatic, basically. You have uh, lots of uh, Romanians living abroad and, and very few coming back. And I think you actually have a lot of potential. So provided you have a certain conditions need to be met. So one of them is, of course, predictability of funding. In the case of Romania, also raising the, the national budget for research because it's at the moment like the, the smallest in the EU. Predictability of funding are uh, trying to uh, offer a little bit uh, better conditions for the start. And with this, the countries like Romania have a very big advantage if they can offer you a non-temporary, a permanent contract, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's the major issue in the West. You have lots of uh, nice positions, but and they are extremely competitive. And they are also, I mean, then you end up spending a lot of, a lot of years on these non-permanent contracts, right? Two years there, three years there, three years there. So one of the mm-hmm. major advantages, and what also basically convinced me about the move, was the advantage of having a permanent position, uh, which at my level of career, I think it's it's essential because you don't want to end up close to the pension going from one place to the other. So that's a big advantage if the predictability of funding, if the budget is a bit increased, and maybe the most important, if the evaluation is done strictly on scientific merit, then I think you have lots of opportunities in countries like Romania. And uh, that's why I like about the Babes Boya University, because the, I think that the mentality, if you wish, is right uh, in that respect. And what also attracts me for this move is basically that coming from abroad with the experience I have, which I might not be top five researchers in the world, but uh, coming with that experience back, I think you can move forward the system there. You can You can contribute to change the, the, the way the research is done in the country. And so that's a very interesting perspective, right? That will be like the very positive aspects about it. Now, of course, the negative aspects are exactly the, the opposite of what I mentioned. Funding is very bad at the moment in Romania. It's increasing. There, there is a lot of movement on that aspect. So there is now a big call for centers of excellence. There is movement, but still the level of the percentage of the GDP that is allocated to research is very, very Predictability is not there. You don't know when the competitions are open. Um, attractivity of the system, it's not there because salary is small in comparison to any... And I'm not talking about comparison of the absolute value. Even if you take into the standard of living, that that's also... It's lower. Mm-hmm. That, if you take the prices into account, whatever. So there, there are some cons, but I, I'm pretty excited actually about the, the next step. And I think it's still going to be very difficult, but I am confident that I still have quite some enthusiasm left. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so, yes, so uh, I hope I can, I can bring some of this around. And I think if, if I find the right atmosphere around the mentality, people like you can, you can really move things forward. And of course, the research is also, I mean, for many of my research, I need high performance computing. We don't have a center in Romania for to be. So these, these are going to be like daily difficulties. You have to, let's say, be smart enough to find alternatives and stuff like this. So it's not as easy as it's here, where you have access to things relatively fast. Um, if you are smart, you can actually go over those obstacles. So I think it'll. Mm-hmm. Right. I think we have to kind of consciously start talking about on maybe dismantling or rebuilding those narratives, right? Around the brain drain and the returns. Because I think our field especially has this unique possibility of having a wide network of collaborators all around the world and not necessarily being, you know, in the facilities. Like, uh, of course, it's great to work with experimentalists who work next door, but there's no problem in principle in, in working remotely with collaborators all around the world. 
the only thing that we actually need to do is to go there, right? And to make those contacts and, uh, and to create a network and then exactly expand this network because as people from you know, nations historically disconnected from global Western science, you only start to realize how big the network is when you go to the West and you discover that, you know, oh, wow, these people had been working together for decades and, and now you're just joining it. And so how can we, I'm talking about, you know, all the people from, from uh, Eastern Europe, from India, from Africa, uh, rest of Asia and South America. How can we take this experience and make it kind of international and get people yeah, so excited about bringing together, work, these working networks? Working together, I think that's the, that's the, the key aspect. And I, I am been placing with, with recent interaction with Romania and basically this, this working together that is so kind of in us um, here, it's it's not always happening. And this is something that needs to change because the progress of science, right, requires you, you cannot do good things if you're just uh, hiding yourself uh, in your own uh, bubble and do your stuff. That's not possible. I mean, the way you, you progress science is by basically talking to people and, and um, working together. And then that's something that I really um, want to, to put my stamp on because this is something that needs to change uh, dramatically in, in the country, at least in Romania. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know about the other countries uh, in the Eastern Bloc and that deep, but in Romania, this, this concept of working together, meeting and chatting about science, um, mm -hmm. um, these kind of things, they, they don't happen, and, and at least not from what I experienced so far. This is, and I also have um, a trouble with the discussion overall, the discussion in the Romanian society, for instance, about the, the, the brain drain, right? So you have the, the brain drain, it's always like, oh, how can we make um, people stop leaving the country? And I, and I always argue, this is not a problem. This is not a problem. You actually want young people to leave the country. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe still study there, but, but after the university, you want them to leave the country. I think the major question is how do you attract these people that once went abroad to come back and i think that's the key point and i i'm, I'm always like i always try to understand why people focus so much you know, about how we stop the people from going instead of how we attract the people to come back and also not only but not only romanians so, so this is also how do you attract people from other countries i mean you could in principle romania uh, with the economic developments and so on i think uh, if I speak just about Romania, uh, quite good in terms of living and so on, if you can offer a decent salary. Not, not, I think no scientist wants luxury. Or I, didn't, I haven't experienced scientists that, that really want luxury. You just want to have a normal life. And I think with that, you, you can start attracting people from uh, other places in the world. You, don't, you actually don't have to focus on only the people who want to return to Romania, but you, you, you should focus on attracting uh, people from other parts of the world. And I think that that's key. That's where you gain as a country. That's where where the people coming to you gain as as a person, right? And, and many of right. Them. That's true. Right. I hope there are those positive feedback loops where you know people people like you or people like my former boss in in Poland who also came back after a postdoc in Germany. You know, essentially implanted this culture of postdocs in his or yours. Hopefully, graduate. So this is something that only becomes a cultural standard when there's a critical mass of people who come back and who want to promote this question. And then it, at some point it becomes a kind of chief political point for the government. I mean, in the end, the, the resources that the government provides for science are uh, on the level of 1% of GDP. So this is really something compared to the kind of uh, image boost of being a modern scientific society this is a very small cost for almost any government right that if, you can uh, all the governments will understand that yeah exactly so they have to have some sort of again critical mass of people who want the change because i think what tends to happen in countries that have this cyclical internal um pedigree of scientists people who don't leave is that people prefer this system over, you know, over this internationalized postdoc scheme, uh, because it's just easier. You don't need to leave anywhere. You don't need to be evaluated. So I think there's inertia in every country before it actually transforms to this, but this transformation is exactly driven by people like you who come back and can, you know, 
can explain the benefits, can explain how this can translate into better outcomes on every level of the economy and society and so on. Yeah, you, you need a you need a good balance, right, between between like continuous exchange and also having some level of also some stability, uh, tenure track positions and stuff like this. Because one of the things that I experienced in the West mm -hmm. um, is basically that it, it's very hard to get a, a tenure track and, and a tenure position, and then then you, uh, I mean, okay, if you are the top one percent, which or five percent that I don't know have all these big grants and so on, then you are safe and it's fine. But if you are a good scientist, um, but maybe you are basically issue, one of the things in, in your CV, then then you have no option, basically. And I think that that's something that also has to change because in life there is also other things, right? So, I mean, as much as we love science, like I love mm -hmm. what I'm doing, basically, I love the academic system, but there are other things in life that are equally, sometimes even more important than that. And then you also have to balance that. And that's why balance systems where you have both this per permanent exchange, especially at a very young level, or PhD, first postdoc, second postdoc, maybe, but combined with, with some stability, okay, based on evaluation and, and everything. I mean, it has to be, I mean, you should not lose your productivity because you are now permanent uh, and stuff like this. But I think uh, always balance. Balance is always good. Right. I hope it inspires some people to, to think about it. And perhaps we have some listeners who, you know, can actually change something in some places. That will be a great outcome. Okay, Vlad, thank you so much for the conversation, for sharing your experience and your knowledge. And uh, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Milos. And good luck with, with the podcast. I hope, uh, yeah, you had some very nice episodes so far. So um, I hope it will continue. I think it's a, it's a great, great initiative. Thanks a lot. I think we have another great episode right now. <laughs> <laughs> have a great day. Let's see you too. Bye. Take care. Thank you for listening. See you in the next episode of Face Space Invaders.